Hello and welcome to the interview on France 24. I'm Andrea Sankey in Paris. From a privileged life status in France to the minimal existence of a Buddhist monk in the Himalayas. So marks the life journey of my guest tonight, Mathieu Ricard. Sometimes referred to as the happiest man in the world, Ricard believes meditative brain training holds a key to contentment. Now, while he holds a PhD in molecular biology, Ricard ultimately dedicates himself to Tibetan Buddhism. Since moving to a Nepalese monastery more than 30 years ago, he's built very close ties with the Dalai Lama. Today, he serves as the Buddhist spiritual leader's French interpreter. But equally important to note, Ricard is an accomplished photographer and author. Evidence of that in a few of his latest publications, including Tibet Visions of Compassion that you can see here. And following that dynamic introduction, Mathieu Ricard joins me here on the interview. Thank you so much for coming in. I suppose the most relevant issue to begin with uh, is the current tension over the nation, which you consider a spiritual home of sorts, Tibet. Just how serious and traumatic is what's happening now inside Tibet? And are you, in a sense, relieved it's happening because it has focused the world's attention on Tibet and the injustices that you believe are occurring there? Well, it is the most serious crisis since uh, almost 30 years. Uh, the extent of the repression, the brutality of the repression. We have names for 192 people that were shot, despite the fact that the Chinese premier said not a single shot was mm -hmm. fired. More than probably 3,000 people were arrested, and we have no news of them. I mean, uh, they probably submitted to torture. They could be sentenced from 15 years to, to the death penalty. And so, and then it's all over Tibet, it's not just in Lhasa area. And so that's very, very serious. And so we get news directly from families who call their relatives in Nepal, in India, and tell you know, news about people who died or people who have been arrested. So this is not just like a list of propaganda that some Tibetan support group might disseminate, but it is, it is direct uh, you know, calls, which are, it's very dangerous now to try to call outside. Mm -hmm. So it is very serious. and the. Options are, are very few, but it must start with a dialogue between the Dalai Lama and the Chinese leaders. He has been asking for many, many years to open that dialogue. And then Xiaoping said, besides independence, everything can be discussed. Now, the Chinese are saying the door is open to the Dalai Lama, but he has to renounce his independentist or splitist activities. He should not, you know, promote the, organize the event that occurred and the, all kinds of totally meaningless uh, arguments because Dalai Lama has, has been in favor of not boycotting the Olympics. He has said many times he doesn't want the independence of Tibet. He wants to negotiate a, a autonomy for the culture, for the language. And also, you know, he, he, there's no way he could organize anything in Tibet. I mean, the Chinese, the, the Tibetans uh, demonstrated on 10th of March, which is the anniversary of the president of 1959. And so it was spontaneous. It, was, it came to an exasperation of 50 years of oppression, compounded by the fact that many of them lost their jobs to the 2,000 Chinese that come every day to the new train, mm. that the intensification of trying to settle the, the nomads against their wishes, the mining that brings thousands of Chinese workers, all kinds of things that Tibetans are just fed up. So was granting China the Olympic Games a good thing for Tibet? Because as I asked in the initial question, it did bring mm. Tibet back into the world's focus. Well, the Dalai Lama was in favor, and many nations were in favor to get, to get in the Olympics to try help China open. But now it turns out that it is the opposite effect. They are completely obsessed with control. They don't care saying the most absurd things to the world. And so it seems now there's a big crackdown in Lhasa. We got a, a call yesterday. They say it's like hell. People have to get a pass to go and buy vegetables. And they said they don't dare to go in the street. They are, they are worried to be taken away mm. and then disappear. So now, what to do? I mean, the, I think the, the, there was need for a clear political will since the China cares so much uh, about the Olympics and so much about the opening ceremony so that na free nations would say, yes, we don't want to boycott the Olympics. The Lama doesn't ask for that. But we will come only if you open this dialogue. After the Olympic Games, there will be nowhere to put any pressure on China. They will just mm -hmm. you know, be say, that's done. 
Now we do what we want, and they will crack down even more severely on the Tibetans. What do you personally expect to happen? Well, you know, before there was a 0.01% chance that they talked to Dalai Lama. I think now they are really, there's a way, there's, there's a means of pressure with this Olympic uh, opening ceremony. You know, if the athletes don't go, if heads of state don't go, there's an, a way of to negotiate. And I think we should seize that opportunity. After that, you know, it's very difficult. <laughs> to say. What do you make then of the anti-French protests that you're now witnessing in China and, and other parts of the world, including here in Paris? Yeah, it seems the complete intolerance, you know. Uh, the no image were shown of the trouble in Athens, in London. They showed a you know, 30 second clip of a few people trying to grab the torch. And there's the immediately engendered that, that, that anger, which is, shows how ridiculous. It's like the, 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 the prophet's cartoon. You know, just a, a, a small, small thing, and everybody gets so angry. It's just it's miserable, you know. But uh, these protesters argue, though, that the Chinese have done wonderful things for Tibet, and well. that uh, <laughs> the world media has manipulated this yeah. in an anti-Chinese uh, propagandist way. Yeah, they did great things from 1959 to 1979. 1.2 million Tibetans died first through the invasion, then in labor camps. Most of my friends of that generation, they spent 20 years in labor camps. This every morning, 20 people dead were, were taken away. Mm. Now there is a renaissance. Of course, there is some liberalization in China for the last 20 years. So this also impacted in Tibet. Some monasteries have been rebuilt. That's nice. But now, today, you can be arrested, sentenced to death for some spurious uh, reasons mm. within an afternoon trial. And then they will say that uh, the person sentenced to death doesn't go for appeal. And then when he's executed the next week, they, the family has to pay for the bullet. Yeah. So, I mean, what kind of nation is that to show to the world? We're down to, unfortunately, our last uh, four minutes now. So I'd, I'd like to ask about you personally and your experience as, as a Buddhist, as a French academic actually uh, becoming a Buddhist. What drew you so passionately to this religion? Well, I don't know if it's a religion to start with, but anyway, I think that, you know, I've seen many wonderful people. I was working in a, in a lab with Nobel Prizes of Medicine. My father was a philosopher, my mother an artist, and my uncle was an explorer. So I met many great genius. At the same time, there was no obvious correlation between their particular skills and human quality. You could be a wonderful gardener and a grumpy gardener, the same with a musician and a mathematician. When I'm went at the age of 20 to meet uh, the great uh, spiritual teacher from Tibet who had fled the Chinese invasion, I found sages and remarkable beings. I was inspired by their way of being. I didn't want to learn sp the specific skill, but I, I wanted to become something like them. So my research went from the chromosomes of bacteria to f unwinding the mechanisms of happiness and suffering, working with the mind, uh, meditation, the transformation of the mind to become a better human being with the idea to put then myself at the service of others. So as application of that, I've now started 30 humanitarian projects in the Himalayas, in Tibet, Nepal, and India. So try to combine inner transformation with some kind of uh, compassionate activity. Why are you the happiest man in the world? <laughs> I should make a disclaimer. <laughs> no, this is a result of some investigation in the, in, from effect of meditation on the brain. When you meditate on compassion, there's a very powerful gamma wave frequency in the brain that's never recorded in neuroscience. I'm not the only one, but I was the first guinea pig. And so a few journalists thought, hey, here's the happiest person in the world. It's better than being the opposite. Mm -hmm. And also, I think anyone can be the happiest person in the world if you know how to, to look for happiness in the right place. You. It, it's interesting when you actually read about how you merge Buddhism with the study of the mind. And you actually have brought before groups of Buddhist monks from your monastery to the University of Wisconsin at Madison, where they've had, you know, up to 30 nodes at a time attached to, to their, their heads. What are you really hoping to discover and sh perhaps bring the rest of the world into if you can prove that meditation equals happiness. You know, scientific inquiry is not about hoping or proving, it's an investigation. Mm -hmm. And now there's seven years and there's a lot of high profile papers published in scientific journals showing that mind training, just like you will train your body or you will reinforce your immune system, mind training just changed the brain structurally, functionally, 
And if a pianist trains, you know, the area of the brain that deals with the finger is increased, but here we are dealing with attention, altruism, compassion, emotional balance. So those are basic quality to the quality of every moment of our life. So if those can be trained as skills, and including happiness, it's of course not so like a secondary hobby, it's something that's critical for our life and that of others. Now you personally, how do you go about living your life as a Buddhist monk? You're, you're in your monastery in Nepal for about, what, seven months out of the year. The other five months of the year you are traveling as a native French man, but as a Buddhist monk. What kind of response do you get from people? How has the adjustment been for you? Well, you know, like, uh, first of all, uh, for many years I didn't come back at all. And then when I started to come back that time, you know, people were not sure, Buddhist, Hare Krishna, whatever. So it was mixed response. I think now there's overwhelming sympathy, thanks to the Dalai Lama sort of being one of the great leaders of our times, you know, as a, as a human figure like Martin Luther King or Gandhi or Nelson Mandela. I think he's one of the most respected moral sort of stature in our world. Mm. And so I think there's a great sympathy. And then, uh, you know, through the ideas that I try to share to, to the books and all that, mostly, I mean, of course, people think you are, you are a jerk, don't tell you usually, but mostly there's a very warm welcome. Are you pleased? Just one final quick question. Uh, the Dalai Lama was given an honorary citizenship of Paris. It was announced just on Monday. Are you pleased to see the Parisian City Council make that, that effort? Yes, it is a recognition to his peaceful and non-violent fight for human rights, and that non-violent fight should be encouraged. If we just react when there's violence, then it's also encouraging indirectly you know, terrorist activities. Unless you do terrorist act, we won't support you. Okay, Mathieu Ricard, very unfortunately, we're out of time for this edition of the interview. But I'd like to thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thanks to our viewers for tuning in as well. That's all for tonight. Another edition tomorrow. Do join us then. Bonsoir. <laughs>